Hello and welcome to yet another video. This is the third episode of the story in which Naruto is civilian due to unforeseen circumstances, Naruto's life is derailed from his intended career. This story is from Ideas Maker, so please support him. Please like and subscribe to show your support. Let's get the show started. Unfortunately, of all those with Naruto's work it's Ryoma that's next to leak with an UZU work. The ex-mobster had underestimated his godson's work as well as its influence. He didn't know his signature is also that influential, he was wrong to think that a calligraphy would be safe. Then again it isn't exactly a normal calligraphy. Of course, at the time he didn't know about this until later, much later. It wasn't bad or dangerous, but the excrimlard had it framed and placed in the center of his household, living room. For some reason, it's giving him an uplifting spirit whenever he looks at it. Thus, he want it where he can see every day. The feeling is like watching the sunrise at dawn it's both majestic and quite an experience. Thanks to it, every day feels like a new day. Obviously, at that point he still hadn't connect the effect to his godson's painting yet. Then again, Noon can fault him for not knowing because it's not like there's an off switch for comparison. As being said, the calligraphy isn't just any simple calligraphy. In fact, what Naruto unknowingly produced is a seal. Not the same seals you see used by ninjas but its earliest form before the ninja era. It's obvious it had no physical effects, but spiritually it's a different story. Hence, the reason why Noon can see it. It's no different to Lucky Charms or Good Lucky Charms. Since it's made by an Uzumaki, its effects are more prominent. Additionally, its positioning has also another effect. However, this is more like a feng shui phenomenon as it purifies the negative energy around his home. Some people may think it's just nonsense, but by repositioning certain items in the room, the household's outlook can change thus indirectly affecting the moods of people within. With Naruto's gift, you can feel the harmony rolling off inside his compound. Ryoma didn't realize it because he thought it's his nostalgia in coming home and seeing his family. His families too are equally clueless as they thought it's the joy of his return. Thus, Noon thought to accuse the new addition to their living room. However, as times go by, Ryoma starts to suspect something. The harmony in his home is one thing, but the small luck and fortune here and there is something that made him suspicious. At first he didn't think much over it, but as it continues he starts to suspect something. Near the beginning it's just a small fortune, something that his daughter won on her weekly lotto purchase. It's no jackpot but it's enough to make her very happy. These things happen, so Ryoma didn't think too deep into it. Then weeks later, it's his wife winning a waffle for a Alex Bensispade trip to the hot springs. It's spontaneous and random, so Noon suspected anything, let alone the calligraphy. The expense paid trip was for two persons only, therefore only two people can be on this trip. So Ryoma opt for his two favorite ladies so they can have a little mother and daughter time together. Since he isn't one. For open bath and hot springs, he choose to stay home and watch the house. Just when he thought he could get a little nice and quiet, another incident literally walked into his life. This happened when he was about to take his daily walk when a stranger walked into him. While no longer taking part in his illegal business, Ryoma is still intimidating thus causing the young man to fall on his ass. Feeling a little sorry for the poor fool, the excrimlard helped him to his feet. After a little exchange, the two got talking. It turns out the young man was sent out on an errand to contact a local business. Apparently, the client kept pushing the date of delivery thus halting the production. Since the young man isn't confident as he should be, the deadline was further delayed and the young man now too having trouble explaining it his own employer. It was pathetic, had it been the past he would had slapped him and told him to shape up. However, since meeting his godson he had mellowed out. So after the little lunch, he went along with him. Ryoma claim he knew the locals, he will come along to make sure he gets a fair deal. With the ex-mobster behind his back, the transition was obviously smoother. 
In fact, it went on so well the goods will be immediately delivered. Unfortunately for Ryoma that wasn't end of it. When the young man returned back to his company and told his superiors, they were so impressed they did an investigation on him. That's where the young man returned with another company representative and offered Ryoma the multi-million business deal. Aside from the local supplies, they want some of the goods in his distribution. Although retired, they found out Ryoma isn't just any nobody. Officially and on legal paper, he controls at least 65% of the local businesses. Hence, they thought it would be more beneficial to directly collaborate with him than seeking small-time supply chains. Sadly, for Dan, the young company employee, he was sent to Ryoma as liaison. In a sense, they want Ryoma to toughen him up. Dan may not hear it through their conversation but Ryoma understood as he knew just what he's going to do. Hence, unfortunate for Dan he will be later put among the excrimlard's rough and tough-looking underlings. He will be put through rookie training, mafia style. Hashtag 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 here is a sneak peek to what's involved Dan's tale, alright, rookie. This is how you negotiate, they handed him a machete but was stopped but another thug. Why did you give him a machete, he's just a rookie he might hurt himself. You are right, the knife slash cleaver was taken away and replaced by a gun. He was about to be shove him into the room when the other guy again opens his mouth. You think he would know how to use a real gun? Man, you are talkative today. This time, he took away the gun before shoving Dan into the negotiation room. To say Dan is horrified was an understatement. At first he was shocked by the big knife, followed by a gun. Unfortunately, when he saw whom he had to negotiate with he wished he had something in his hands. They are all twice his size. Naturally, the negotiate never got off as he was tied to the chair. What the f asterisk 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 are you doing here? Instead of a negotiation, it turned into an interrogation. As that's going on inside, outside the two goons continued their discussion. You think he can convince them? Did you tell him what this is about? The boss isn't going like this, right? I don't think so. Having finished that, the two entered and took over the negotiation. However, their tactics were just getting their point across with their fist. In half an hour it ended and Dan unrestrained. Kid, I think you failed. Good job, just blame it on him, the other whispered trying not to be heard. How the hell do you expect me to fight them? Everyone negotiate differently. You just have to find one that suits you. Wise, says the other but in a whisper manner. Hey, wait a minute. You clowns didn't even tell me what we were negotiating. Oh, crap. I was hoping that he didn't notice. As Dan relay the event, Ryoma laughed. Well Dan, what have you learned? That you have fools? That may be true, but you have to learn to work with what you have. However, tonight wasn't so bad. How's that? Compared to when we first met, do you think you are still alike? Remember that same guy you were sent to negotiate, do you think you have a problem talking to him anymore? It was true, he's no longer feel afraid. Even the employers from his own company noticed his change. Sadly, despite his newfound confidence, he's still sent along with other goons for more negotiation. He's maybe more confident, but there are still plenty scenarios and situations that would scare him poor Dan hashtag 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 Dan's tale 2 hashtag 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 unfortunately for poor Dan, he never did graduate from the negotiation program. Thus, it obviously continued and his next negotiation session involved 20 others with the opposition. Once again he found himself on unfamiliar grounds as no words were exchanged. For over 20 minutes, the two sides only stared at one another. Dan became the odd one as he broke eye contact in first two minutes thus ended up shifting nervously between them. He tries to make himself as inconspicuous but his nervousness and action made him the center of attention. If Dan thought the situation couldn't get any worse he will be disappointed as the negotiation just went up another level as the other group shown their weapons. 
Now Dan understand why they are called the Axe Gang as every member carry at least one axe by their belt. Ryoma's gang too show they were prepared as each have a machete beneath their jacket. Only Dan is ill prepared as he had neither an axe nor a machete. He wouldn't move forward since it's the menacing axe gang in front of him, he couldn't squeeze back neither since Ryoma's men formed an impenetrable wall behind him. So he ended up stuck. Nervously between the two sides readying for a weapon fight. The negotiation went on for another twenty minutes and Dan still couldn't do anything, nor did he have anything good on his mind. Trying to sneak to either side would only draw attention to himself. He will be branded as both a coward and a traitor. He's literally stuck between a rock and hard place. That's when the atmosphere broke as the two sides laughed like it was a joke. Later you can hear Dan complaining as the two sides made fun of him. Apparently, the Axe Gang were already a part of Ryoma's group. They thought it would be funny to see how the rookie would react. By the end of the day, the others told him this was how it was when they were two separate gangs. Today was just reminiscing their past while giving him a show. Although he's a little angry, Dan couldn't help but respect Ryoma for his past. Sure they have fun on his account but he couldn't stay mad at them for long. Despite not being a full member, he felt himself treated like a family. While these people don't act like those in his office but they are loyal. It may seem like he's always in danger but in reality he's feeling protected and someone is always around the corner watching over him. Hashtag 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 end of Dan's tale anyway, as days continue and his normal routine sets in, friends and some of his close associates came to visit. Unfortunately, that's where things gets problematic as one of his guests recognized the UZU signature. Dojima may had warned him but he didn't think calligraphy is a problem. He had truly underestimated his godson's call sign as well as his associate's perception. Ryo Mason, isn't that the famous UZU work that the elemental nation had been searching? How did you get it? Really? I wasn't aware of that. For your information, I got it from an old friend. Ryoma quickly responded to not seem suspicious and playing the ignorant card. Unfortunately, his associate is persistent. Come on Ryoma, aren't we old friends? You can tell us. He causally refer himself as, us, to include the others, it was an obvious ploy to make his request less selfish and that there are others whom are interested. Despite noon else are demanding an answer, the others too were interested how such one of a kind treasure is in their friend's hands. Sorry Sagarason, you know me. Whatever that thing is worth, it isn't something to betray a trusted friend. Luckily Ryoma responded well as he brings out his motto as others knew how to back down. You are right. Sorry, Ryomason. Despite his apology, Sagara never did gave up as he later hires ninjas to try to steal it for himself. Under normal circumstance, they would have succeeded because it should be an easy assignment. However, by some strange circumstance, the ninjas found themselves failing. At first they thought it was just a coincident but it then became apparent that something else was also in play. On their first attempt, they thought it was an accident when the entire wall collapsed. Apparently, the wall became loose and fell the moment their leader land on it. So on their initial attempt the team had to quickly retreat because their client gave specific instructions to not leak their identity. Later they found out the fault was solely on a weakened old wall. However, had this been one of the genins it would be more understandable but this is the team leader and a seasoned jonin. Nevertheless, despite the setback the team try again once the event died down. Having learned their lesson, this time they chose to leap over without touching the wall. They were given perfect layout of the place thus they knew where their target landing points are. Having checked, by listening, that the other side is clear, the group took to the air and landed soundlessly on the other side. However, to the group's surprise they found themselves surrounded by hounds as they bare their fangs at them. Just by their stances and formation, the ninjas knew these were highly trained animals. Apparently, since the last attempt, 
Ryoma had added a few extra security measures by asking a friend to loan him some guard dogs. They were no different to ninja dogs, just without a ninja partner. Since the elemental nation is full of ninjas, aside from hiring ninjas the other option is to fight them. Hence, in this case some chose to train their own ninja dogs. Again since the biggest threat are ninjas, the animal were trained mostly to combat them. That's how the jonin came to recognize them thus beat and hasty retreat. Unfortunately, one unlucky jenin wasn't fast enough and almost had his arm torn off. Thankfully he was able to get away without an injury but the hound took a piece of his fabric as souvenir. It was later picked up by the ex-mobster but it was no longer necessary because Ryoma had already started an internal investigation on his friends and found Sagara especially suspicious. His suspicion were well-founded as they later discover he's been secretly funneling his money to a separate account for a very long time. Noon suspected him because he's one of his longest and closest associates. However, because of one calligraphy Sagara finally revealed his true colors. Again, this is somehow directly or indirectly linked to his godson's gift. Sadly, before he could think too much into it, another incident shortly followed. It had only been three weeks and the surprise came in form of five visitors at his front door slash gate. He was surprised because he had no personal relation with any of them. However, he knew them all very well as the first he immediately recognized as the local mayor. Three he knew were from the trade union, he recognized them for their reputation because they all respected members of the traders' community. Finally the fifth and last is the treasurer of the royal fire court. It's rare to one of them around, let alone five. Thus, Ryoma's sinking feeling as this may have something to do with his godson's creation. This again. Remind him of Dojima's warning but at the time he thought he only meant his paintings. However, it's clear through Sagara's betrayal he's been underestimating his godson's work. Although a little annoyed, the feeling wasn't directed at his godson nor his gift. As he contemplating on slamming the door on these dignitaries, the treasurer was the first to speak. Greetings Ryo Mason, we learned that you may have acquired a treasure. Knowing where this is going, Ryoma heard enough thus was about to close the door on them until the man quickly added. Wait, wait. Please let me assure you that we are not here for anything. What is yours will be yours and we have no right to confiscate anything. Today or ever. He added the last part to ensure Ryoma understand that. In order to reassure him his intention are true, he points to the other dignitaries. I have Mayor Yashima and other respectable dignitaries as witnesses. Eyeing them one by one, Ryoma chose to give him the benefit of doubt. They are all well known to be fair and never once bend to corruption. The least he could do is to hear them out. What is it you all want? Breathing a sign of relief and looking around the neighborhood, the treasurer trepidately answered. Perhaps we can discuss this in a more private manner? Sighing to himself, Ryoma opened the door fully for his new guests. Come on in. I apologize for how I was before. Ryoma then proceeded the reason of his irritation. Not so long ago, I had to confront a close friend trying to steal from me. Long story short, it left a bitter taste. Understandable. No harm done. We too apologies for the bad timing and unannounced visit, says the treasurer. Others too nodded, under same circumstances they would feel the same way. However, once they are in the guest room, their eyes immediately found themselves looking at the very item they were here for. It was not lost in the excrimlard's eyes. I take it that's the reason why you are all here it was more of a statement than a question. Snapping away from their surprise, the five dignitaries was a little embarrassed as they composed themselves. As guests they should at least present themselves properly before focusing on the objective of their visit. They should had known the moment they step into the compound. While the garden is a work of art and impressive, it's not enough to generate such level of tranquility and harmony. Of course at the time they couldn't see it. It wasn't until they saw the UZU artwork did they realize nothing is ever truly perfect. 
Our apologies, but you are correct. Coughing to clear up their dignities, the five resume their business stance. Don't worry about, I rather we do this in the open than hide behind some false pretense and appearance. As the refreshments are prepared and the guests settle in, the royal treasurer can start his explanation. Ryo Mason, let me reaffire what I said before. We are not here to claim it or confiscate it. However, you are right. We are indeed here about the painting, or rather the calligraphy. The others too nod their heads in agreement showing their support. Seeing they are somewhat being reasonable, Ryoma made himself comfortable to hear what they have to say. Ryo Mason, as you may or may not have heard, the Yuziu creation in Suna had recently been declared a national treasure. By doing so, Sand Country had essentially laid claim to it such that it cannot be sold outside the country. This was a joint agreement by all parties to prevent theft and smuggling outside the nation. The reason why this is such a big deal is because it's signed by all the daimyos across the nation. Therefore, even when it's stolen, when found the piece will return back to the registered owner. As being said, that should partially explain why we are here. I had to admit, our initial intention was to verify the authenticity of the rumored newly discovered UZU artwork. However, the moment we set foot behind your walls we should have known what you have is genuine. Curiously, Ryoma couldn't help but ask. How so? He had his own suspicion but he wants to hear what they know. It's not 100% certain, however studies from Suna came up with many findings and theories. One thing they are certain is that it cannot be replicated. At least not fully. That sounded strange because Ryoma knew a few professional forgers that can make copies of anything. Thankfully he didn't have to tell them about his other live in the criminal world as they elaborate. They could copy the art but not what made it special. Unfortunately, that mystery continues to elude the researchers as they debate over its unique property. Back in the prison, Dojima and Kurito often use those words but Ryoma never did truly understand them. However, through his gift, calligraphy, Ryoma can understand how unique it is. Now that it is mentioned, the ex-mobster did recall those strange events that happened over the past few months. Did it do all that? Then again, it's hard to see a connection, especially when you are not superstitious. Despite that, Ryoma still strongly believe his godson's gift is somehow behind it. Dojima and Kirito did often praise how his work are unique and through his calligraphy, he too believe there's something special to his creation. Stopping in his thoughts, Ryoma had to wonder. Is this another one of his pranks? He was there when someone discovered his prank as it naturally brought the entire prison a storm of chaos. Despite not being a target, Ryoma couldn't help but turning his calligraphy gift upside down when his godson isn't looking just to be sure. Thankfully unlike paintings, kanjis aren't that flexible. Then again, the boy have the knack of turning the impossible possible. Hence, even as his godfather when it comes to ramen and pranks, noon is 100% certain. The boy meant well but sometimes it takes a lot of effort to outthink him or anticipate all his surprises. When Ryoma first heard about the inversion incident, he was surprised how Dojima was particularly silent then. He was usually the first to praise his godson for his talent, hence why he thought his inaction odd. That's how he realized Naruto must had somehow pranked him as he remember his gift. It was clear Dojima must had been really embarrassed. With all the chaos in prison, Ryoma gave the headman a little dignity to himself. Thankfully, everyone was busy finding their little art having extra little secrets. Ryoma had seen them, because everyone came to him to complain. Of course, none of them did truly complained, it was more of showing to others what he did and they all got a laugh from it. Coming back to the five dignitaries, what they are telling is beyond the level of a prank. To change a ninja village's fate? Having heard their story and what Wind Country was like, Ryoma too wasn't surprised how everyone thought that. Truthfully, it was because of his godson's painting that the ninja village as it is now. 
While he's pleased his godson's work caused such positive change, however this is beyond Kirito and Dojima's expectations. Now Ryoma can understand why the two had reasons to be worried. It is also clear to him now that the fire daimyo foresaw such scenario thus why the prison, new art gallery, wasn't open to the public. Once the topic on Suna is over, Ryoma knew they will be moving on to the main topic of their visit. To be honest, Ryomason. The purpose of our visit was only to verify the rumor. However, we weren't expecting a genuine artwork, let alone something completely different. Ryoma understood what they meant because this calligraphy is probably his godson's alternative work. The reason we knew it's genuine is because the moment we step into your living room, all our eyes were drawn to it. Oddly enough, Yuzu artwork have that effect on nearly everyone. He was speaking from the reports as he note that the Kazakage seems to be immune to its effect. He assumed it will only affect art lovers. Anyway, like the piece in Suna, there's also the lively vibe that made it unique. I guess you are right, since putting it up my home had been more lively. At first I didn't notice but it's overall more lively. However, calling it lively would be an understatement. From there, Ryoma tells them about the odd events over the past months. The betrayal of his close associate to ninjas involved. Oddly enough, although the security isn't that sophisticated, for some reason the ninjas were thwarted by one mishap after another thus lead to mission failure. Obviously, Ryoma only learned of this event much later when he informed the ninja village of their employers arrested. Amazing? Increable. That's the general response of his audience. From there each of the dignitaries talk about their own experience on similar cases. I learned that sentient swords can sometimes choose their owners, perhaps that's also true on UZU creation, says the mayor. The others seem to agree as they further talk about the mystery surrounding Suna from other dignitaries. Through them, Ryoma learned more about his godson's creation. Little Maelstrom, that's what they used to call him. The name seem fitting somehow, seeing how his work is now causing a storm in the elemental nation. Internally, Ryoma chuckled but at the same time more convinced that the past odd events were part of his godson's package. Not that he minded, because aside from the effects it actually helped him unmask a traitor in his organization. He may not be superstitious but years with his godson made him immune to the strangeness that surrounds him. Especially his luck in poker because even in his long gambling experience he had never seen that many royal flushes, straight flushes, for of a kind and full houses in one day. Yet he saw them through his godson one after another. The kid never could understand how incredibly rare they were and it's pointless trying to explain the concept of probability. Because at the time, all he cared about is winning. Seeing this the other tried passing cards under the table. They weren't trying cheat him but did it to see the extent of his luck but to their surprise the kid still won. The boy had a hard life even the gods once in a while bless him with something. At least that's what the inmates thinks, thus how they were calling him their little mascot. They didn't mind losing to him, especially when the stakes are all about ramen coupons. Ryoma still couldn't help but shake his head from how the kid being so happy about winning ramen. Ryomason, what's on your mind that made you smile like that? He had almost forgot himself in the past. Never mind, I was just reminded of another strange encounter from my past. From there he speak of the odd incidents but leaving out the details. For all the other know, it's one of his old days. That young man must have some abnormal amount of luck or that he's cheating. That's the funny thing, there's no evidence in cheating. One time they even played it with all cards facing upwards and all the cards he received somehow came out as the winning hand. Hence, since then everyone learned better to bet against him. Unknown to the dignitaries, none of them were aware that he's talking about the same originator of these paintings. Despite the deception, Ryoma found himself friends with these people. While he isn't a lover in paintings like them, they had other common grounds. Especially in trade, as his recent encounter gave him access to a rising company, Dan's company, that's on the lookout by these people. 
Once again, Ryoma couldn't help but take a quick glance at his godson's calligraphy. Did it do all this? Nah, that would be silly. There's no way to tell. While these people are here because of Uzu, the rest of the event he was his usual self. This is no. Different to fortune telling, they can tell you will be meeting people but unless you live on an island you will bound to meet someone. The fortune teller can tell you having good slash bad luck today, it will depend on your interpretation on what is considered as good slash bad luck. It was for this reason that Ryoma isn't a believer in superstition. Aside from trade, the local mayor too found a friend in him as Ryoma help him improve the region he govern. With his connections, Ryoma can easily tell him about the local gossips and troubles in his region. Not only that, the ex-gangster can easily provide cost-efficient fixes that could benefit all parties. Hence, for this reason the Major too liked to see him as a personal friend. Through this visit, they had each one way or another gained either a business partner or a valuable friend. Between them Ryoma is like a missing piece in their circle. Like for the mayor, Ryoma is someone that can help him on his reform in his region. Aside from his newly position with the rising company, he had connections and some many of them hadn't heard of. Hence, in term of trade he can offer great deals in high quality and even exotic goods. Most surprisingly of all, they each one way or another found themselves someone sharing some of their hobbies. Ryoma may not be much of a painting enthusiast but he does have a wide range of other hobbies. By the end of the day, some starts to wonder if this was the power of the UZU artwork. Were they all manipulated? Even if they are, they can't seem to think of any downside. In the end, they can only shake their heads because noon can say for certain. Nevertheless, it's one productive day and they all agree to stay in touch and meet again sometime. As for the royal treasurer, Ryoma nudge him to speak privately to the fire lord and ask explicitly about the fire prison. It's suspicious but having got to know his new friend, Kurosaki, treasurer, felt he can take a leap of faith. He's also surprised that Ryoma is some way also connected to the fire lord. Nevertheless, he will no doubt speak to the fire lord on their next meeting. Fire capital coming back to Naruto, when he arrive at the capital he was in awe of the city because it's much bigger than his home village. It is at least a hundred times bigger and the streets are filled with many people. The only time he had seen that many people gathering was during festivals. However, according to the daimyo this is daily life in the capitals. On the way, the fire lord points out various places in his city. Even on a carriage it still took a few hours to reach the palace gates. Then again, the palace isn't just a building because it include a huge stretch of land beyond. The best description would be a city within a city. It's beautiful and from the high grounds outside the city, they can see how the palace is separated by walls and water. Inner wall protecting the palace whereas the outer defends the whole city from invaders. From a distance they can see guards patrolling between the outposts. There are also four entrances from the city into the palace as their gates and bridges that connects them. Even on a carriage, it took them a couple of hours to reach the palace gate from the city entrance. It shows just how big the fire capital is as the young painter marvel at the scene and highlights. Unfortunately, by the time they arrive at the palace it was already late. So the daimyo had his staff show him around the palace and prepare him something to eat. Obviously, our hero wanted ramen. Although an odd request for a royal guest, the kitchen nevertheless complied. That's where surprise hit him as the ramen although different to his favorite ramen stand, Ichiraku, it's very good in a different way. Long story short, Naruto barge into the kitchen and wanted answers. Normally this would be considered rude but since he's still a child noon-minded. They had heard the palace will be receiving a young guest for a while, therefore everyone's curious. Besides everyone loved a compliment. This is especially true when Naruto brought up the Ichiraku's name as they were well known in the culinary world. Just like how he was in prison, he unknowingly found himself talking animatedly with the palace staff. 
It's his nature and part of his upbringing, lack of. Naruto wanted to have friends therefore wherever he go, he would unconsciously attach himself to people around him. This behavior became a conditional reflex thanks to his mistreatment in Kanoha. Seeing these people treating him as any normal person, he too responded in kind. It was that charm that draw people towards him. As long as you don't have any negative prejudice towards him, Naruto could easily win those he talked to over. Combined with his childish animated way he talk, few would find him a bore to talk to. Hey, who made this ramen? Our blonde guest asks. We did, is it not to your satisfaction? asks one of the young staff member. You kidding? This is the best ramen I had in years. Best ramen? Really, the young staff obviously didn't know because noon orders food such as ramen in the palace. To be honest, you are the first that orders it. What? What's wrong with ramen? They obviously don't know what they are missing. Few ever came close to Ikiraku's, but this is just as good. Ichiraku, a new voice added. You know them? Of course, they made the best ramen. Back when I was in Kanoha, I go there nearly every day. Who are you? I am the one that cooked you your ramen, you can call me Yukihara or Chef Yukihara. Really? I say you nailed it, I can't tell which is better. Old man Ichiraku or yours? Old man Ichiraku? Ha ha ha, I like you kid. You know I am. How's she doing? I am? She's doing great, at least the last time I saw her she was still working in the ramen stand back in Kanoha but that was a bit over five years ago. He was a little sad when he said that but quickly. Shift back to his cheerful self. This was not missed by those in the kitchen thus chose not to ask about it. Thankfully Yukihara changed the subject by tell his own story with the Ikarakus and he battled them with ramen. It immediately caught the blonde's attention. In fact, just about anything to do with ramen he would listen. Since this is about his favorite people in Kanoha, he's more than happy to hear about it. Apparently, this was some kind cuisine competition where the main theme happens to be ramen. Unfortunately for Yukihara, the Ikarakus have a secret recipe for ramen where they gain significant sway with the judges. It's more shocking when their ramen gain full points from each of the judges. He knew mentally, the judges will be harder to sway now therefore he will need something stronger with a powerful kick. So he scrapped everything and start everything anew from scratch. Luckily he managed to contain himself as he calmly access his situation while contemplating his available options. He may not have a secret recipe like the Ikirakus but he have ingredients. As a matter of fact, he have very fresh ingredients. Make that very fresh and exotic ingredients. That gave him an idea as he fish out a live lobster and turn it into parts. What caught the judge's interest is how he used some of those parts in his process in making the actual ramen, noodles. The ramen is usually made with flour, but to actually introduce food ingredient in it is new. If he doesn't mess up its texture it could be revolutionary. However, Yukihara didn't end it there as he put a number of exotic ingredients in the pot. Through that process, he aimed to remade the soup to match the lobster taste which he will use as part of the topping. The effect is clear as the strong aroma slowly ooze from the pot and envelope the site. Just its rejuvenating smell was enough to set everyone hungry for a taste to what's come. Combined with the full course topping along with the lobster, the finished bowl was not only mouth-watering it's something everyone wants to try. Despite that incredible effort, it only managed to take his dish on to the same playing field as the Ikirakus. Hence, in the end the Ikirakus is still number one when it comes to ramen. Although disappointed, Yukihara had to admit their ramen is very good. In a traditional sense, they won hands down. However, if it's about innovation he had them beat. So in the end, it was a draw and the Kanoha duo keeping the champion title. That's how he was hired by the palace and nearly ten years ago. By the end of the story, the staff again treated with another funny scene as the table where their young guest listening from had a pool of drool. 
Ignoring them, Naruto demanded. Old man Yukihara, make me this ramen. That was it. You already ate it. Everyone turned to his bowl including our hero. This time they are treated with shocked Naruto as he cry animatedly with anime tears. What? What have I done? I forgot. To taste it. His expression too was laughable too as he looked like it was the end of the world. Stop being so dramatic about it, I will make you another. This time they can see tears on his eyes. You will, see him nod in return he cheered. Yada. The rest of the staff clearly aren't used to his antics as he switched from one extreme emotion to the next. It's a welcome change for the kitchen because their day is usually a little dull. Even the head chef is more talkative than he is for a month. That's Naruto's charm, as he can be very expressive and animated when it comes to his things, this is especially true for his friends. Chef Yukihara only smirked but got to work. He had plenty of fresh ramen, so all he needed is to cook them. In less than 15 minutes, it's ready and Naruto quickly dug in. This time he made sure to savor the taste. It's good, Yukihara old man he slurped loudly. Don't call me an old man, I am only 45. Yeah, and I am 11 you are still an old man. He didn't mind the kid calling him old, but it reminded him of his own youth because that's how he talked to his own father. Perhaps that's karma that they send this kid here to torment him. Young people these days, they have no respect for their elders. See, even you admitted to yourself you're an old man. Especially with phases like that. He's speechless because he had nothing to say against that. That's when he realized the rest of the younger staff watching the blonde kid eating animatedly. Thanks to the story and the kid's antics, the others couldn't help but feel like having ramen too. Here, I saved some for guys too. It didn't take long for everyone to join in as they eat alongside the over-enthusiastic boy. Sighing to himself, Yukihara joins them eating the same ramen he made. Might as well eat it. I swear this is somehow the blonde's doing. It only made the kid more happy as he boost how great ramen is. Others too agreed because it had been a long time since they last ate ramen. This was especially true in the palace as they had many royal dishes to choose from and very few would chose such commoners' food. However, they all agreed Chef Yukihara's ramen is splendid. While that's true, many couldn't help but think it's the blonde that roped them into eating ramen. Happily the group talk animatedly and happily about how long ago they last had such simple meal. The rest of the night went smoothly for our hero as he was later showed to his quarters. It was quite surprise because his bed is bigger than his cell, prison cell. There's also its texture as Naruto test its feel. Overall, it's like heaven to him as he slept comfortably for the night. By morning he's taken to breakfast. Unknown to him, Yukihara had a surprise for him thus made him another special. This was another dish he thought of before coming to the palace. Seeing how his guest liked his lobster special, he spent the night perfecting his old experimental dish. Unknown to him, the Fire Lord will also be ordering ramen for breakfast. The head palace chef will probably remember the daimyo's aid there last night. She was also the same girl that lead the blonde to the palace cafeteria thus she obviously must had reported the evening. The reason he forgot about her is because not only is she quiet, she had also a very weak presence. Unless she speak, very few know she's actually in the same room. Hence on few occasions she even scared the daylight off him. It's not that he outright dislike her but that strange ability of hers is an annoyance. It's one mystery he could never figure out hence whenever he knew she's around his head would hurt. Last night was a fine example, he knew he served her because there's an extra bowl besides all the people he counted. That's the evidence of her being there. Sadly, the staff in the palace either didn't care or simply just accept that's how she is. Hence, in the palace only Yukihara is the odd one that complains about her presence. He did confront the daimyo only to see the very girl with tears in the background. Obviously she was there the entire time and he didn't see it. 
As a result, he ended up apologizing and explaining himself. He even have to admit he's old and her special ability is bad for his heart. In order to stop her tears, he even have to promise to make her anything she wants to eat. Funny enough, all the Fire Lord said from that was. There, problem solved. He said it like he had just fixed their problem from both sides. Coming back to our hero, once he finishes his breakfast he had time before the official meeting thus he had time to explore the palace. He was accompanied by the same aid as she show him around. Thanks to Fire Capital's successful economy, the palace is vast and almost endless. One of such place is the the palace tower as it's the only place where you can see the entire fire capital and beyond. It's apparently Nadia's, Fire Lord's aid, favorite place. The high altitude remind Naruto of his old favorite place when he was sad. However, like in Konoha the view was enough brighten his mood and made him see how majestic the capital truly is. Unfortunately as much as they want to stay and soak in the view, the meeting with the fire daimyo is something they couldn't miss. So Nadia lead him to their destined meeting spot where they can conduct official business. There the daimyo explains the full implication of their deal and paperwork. Although boring it's one necessity someone like him needed to understand. The fire lord explains he didn't want any loopholes, hence the documents needed to be through. This is especially true for one such as Naruto because he's originally a Konoha citizen. Hence, in order to ensure his citizenship in the capital is legal, all his paperwork must be triple-checked. At the same time, the Fire Lord had to be patient to explain to him why it was necessary and important. His criminal status was all because of politics, hence it's highly likely they will once again use the same tactics. However, once he's legally recognized as a fire capital citizen the fire daimyo can lawfully intervene. This mean he can rightfully expunge his criminal record. He may not be able to do anything to his status in Konoha but to the rest of the world, his record from the capital takes precedence. Then again, the outside world wouldn't trust a ninja village's record over a daimyo's. Hence, in a sense the daimyo had given him free reign to do business anywhere in the world without repercussion. Also the paperwork would ensure those from Konoha couldn't force him back with loopholes as they will be triple-checked by the royal administration court. Once that's out of the way, the fire lord move on to address other arrangements. Unfortunately, that's where they hit a block. Are you sure, Naruto my boy? I am offering you a place inside the palace. You will be treated as a guest like a royalty and you can stay as long as you want. Thanks Daimiya-sama, no offense but it feels like I am free-loading off you. Nonsense, my boy. I am sure you have seen how big the palace is. It's built too easily to accommodate hundreds if not a thousand guests. Yeah, I can see that. However, I am afraid I do not know how to explain it but I wanted freedom without attachment. Somehow living as a freeloader just doesn't sit well with me. Thankfully, the Fire Lord understood thus not push the matter. He had met many talented artists in the past and they all have their own strange quirks. The reason is psychological, as the creative side of their mind needed to be freed. Some may argue that the prison isn't freedom but that's again psychological as our hero is maybe surrounded by walls but he's free to do what he wants. However, when he arrive at the palace his mind mentally create barriers for himself. Social standards, living arrangements, responsibilities etc., they are all mental barriers in daily life. Hence, some people prefer isolating themselves when stress is too much for them to handle. It's alright, Naruto. You'll be surprised I understand as I had met many talented artists being like that. So you aren't alone. I tell you what, there's a place just outside the wall of the palace. You wouldn't be too far and can come to visit any time, not to mention you will be close the palace guards. It sounded reasonable and as the daimyo suggest, he can still come and visit. Especially after making friends with Yukihara and Nadia. Anyway, the initial arrangement was for him to stay inside the palace where he will be protected. They had already discussed about his Jinchuriki status, 
thus he understood why he needed protection. Unfortunately, unlike ninja villages the fire daimyo had no regulation for Jinchuriki citizen so he can only treat him like a any royal guest of his and hope for the best. Please remember you are welcome to come to me and the palace guards should you ever need anything. Anyway, don't be surprised to see me every so often as I will be coming by to see what other wonders you will be making next. That comment was enough to crack the gloomy atmosphere turning the conversation to happier topics. To Naruto, the Fire Lord is just like Warden Dojima thus making him feel comfortable talking to him. I will look forward to it, Daimiya-sama and I will have something ready by then. Having said that, the two laughed joyously. Through that little exchange, it's clear that due to his naive and inexperienced handling the outside world, he's counting every art lover a friend. His godfather, Ryoma, is perhaps an exception but to his young mind, he would think those that like art can't be that bad. Anyway, since his godfather had vouched for the Fire Lord he will trust him. Listen well, Naruto. Most staff in the palace will be aware of your status as my personal guest. Hence, you have the freedom to go anywhere as you please unless otherwise. Prohibited areas will have guards stationed and they will tell you so. So don't be afraid to come to me if you need anything. Seeing the blonde understand he continued. Another thing, I am sure you may already know this, your Jinchuriki status must be kept strictly a secret. So please don't spread it around. While I don't think my people are as stupid as those in Kanoha, but they may think you are some kind of a nutjob. Naruto knew he's joking but understood nevertheless. Seeing he had lightened the mood, the fire daimyo move on to the next business matter. By clapping his hands twice, a young lady enter and sat by the daimyo. All right, Naruto. Now let's talk about the prison. A little confused the blonde asked there. Why? Paperwork, paperwork. Every time we approve something, it needs to go down the record. So a ton of paperwork needs to be filled. Luckily I have a very talented assistant Himoto to take care of the necessary documents. The fire daimyo said that as he points to the young girl waving in response. Now he understand why she's here and had been scribbling the entire time. As the fire lord suggests, she will take notes now and later prepare the right papers. Oh. Okay. Naruto nodded but clearly he's clueless what it all meant. Laughing a little, the fire daimyo explain a little about the official process. Don't worry, my boy. I promised I will take care of you and I meant it. The technical jargon may be a little too much for an 11-year-old, but the daimyo is patient. Anyway, as you already know the prison will become a museum. However, what I want to discuss are what's inside. I am talking about your paintings, he clarified for his young guest's benefit. He could almost see his brain light up as he understood what he meant so he continued. For legal reasons, I want this to put on record that they are all rightfully yours. He can see the surprise on his face, so he elaborate. As much as I want them for myself, I don't think I can afford all of them. Naruto was about to interject but the daimyo knew what he's going to say thus stopped him. Naruto, as the most powerful man in the country. To simply accept them would be a crime. This time it's confusion showing on his face so the fire lord continues. You may have yet to understand but these paintings are valuable. Not only are they a work of art, they each have its own unique powers to tell people their story. Dojima had warned him, Despite being the artist the boy lacked the mind's eye to see through his own creation. Ahem. Let's just say people can feel through your paintings okay. Okay. Naruto didn't know how else to answer so he just agreed. So, anyway long story short. A lot of people and artists had tried to replicate that uniqueness but failed. Thus, as result its value was raised astronomically. On the other hand, this in turn attracted many collectors' attention. Unfortunately, they are also very rich, powerful and influential thus triggering the chaos that was in Suna. Again, several copies of newspapers were shown to him for his benefit. 
as he go through the headlines that lead to eventual opening of the famous museum. One article caught his eye, as he recognized his own painting, Night Lotus. There were obviously several papers that uses different names he weren't aware of but he agreed it does have a nice ring to it. That's where he wondered about Hosuksen, did he cause him his death? Thankfully, the Fire Lord learned about him from Dojima thus can reassure him that his friend passed away peacefully. As a matter of fact, Hosuk did everything he could to keep it hidden by having a secret basement. Unfortunately, the moment he pass away it was only a matter of time that it's discovered. Thus the Suna situation. I am sure you had heard it many times from Doja Mason. He may not be that good of an appraiser but he does know his stuff. Dojima did mention to the Fire Lord how Naruto didn't quite believe him thus urge him to explain it to the knucklehead blonde. He wasn't exaggerating because what you had created is something never been seen before. On top of that is its beauty, so please have a little pride in your work and give yourself some credit. In response, Naruto couldn't help but blush at the praise. Thank you my lord, it's so surreal. But all I did was paint it the same way I was taught. I know, I heard. Kiritosen taught you, right? Naruto nodded. Honestly, I had seen some of his work. If I have to say it you had long surpassed him. I am sure you already know this. The daimyo is right, but at the time our hero just didn't want to admit it. The day Kirito stopped painting was when the pupil surpassed him. Yet he continued to urge him to paint and setting challenges. Perhaps Naruto didn't want to acknowledge it because deep down he wanted to stay a student. As of now, one of your painting triggered a worldwide hunt for you. However, lucky for us they didn't know whom they were looking for. Again, Dojima had a right to be concerned as he had always believed in the phase, in the world of ninjas, secret do not stay secret for long. So, until we know for certain what they want it's best to lie low for the time being. The world isn't safe because in the worst case scenario they could kidnap you and force you to work while they cash in on your efforts. The fire daimyo wasn't keen on scaring him but he need him to understand why such precaution is a necessity. Sometimes, it's better with an example than a lecture. Hence, how he brought a few artist kidnapping case records for his benefit. Although they are few but they do happen. Seeing his guest understand, they move on. Now, back to the our painting issue. With the UZU storm that's happening in Suna, your painting was declared a national treasure. It was clearly quite a shock for our hero as his face shows it but the daimyo continues. It's another reason why I can't accept your generous gifts. If I suddenly have this many national treasures in my possession. A political shitstorm would be the least of my problem. The other reason would be my pride. One word of advice, Naruto my boy. Please stop being generous to people like us. I know you mean well, but some of us might take it as an insult. This is all politics, but you will be learning in near future. The daimyo clarify further. I am talking about the upper class people like myself. We all have our own pride. You mean, I should overcharge people, asks the very confused blonde. In a manner of speaking, yes, his response only further confuse him but the fire lord explain. People like us have our own pride, hence the more expensive they are, the better. Just to be clear, they aren't just any random prices to drive up the market. Again, the knowledge is starting to steam the young artist's head. For someone with little to no knowledge in economics, it's not easy to understand. M, please let me rephrase that. Basically, your painting are very valuable for its artistic value. However, once it is known that Noon can do what you do. It became unique thus became even more valuable. Today, what is unique is what people want thus are willing to pay high prices for. For high-class people like us, aside from its attraction, its value is equally important. Hence, when we come to retell it, its price is highly significant. Therefore, the more expensive it is the more prestigious they may seem to others. It was odd for our little hero but at least he understands. 
So if I charge a million, would it be better? It was just a figure of speech and a common figure he hear people talk but the reaction from the daimyo surprised him. That's acceptable, I had seen all your work they are at least worth that much if not more. Naruto had never seen a million Ryo before but even he can imagine. At least, in terms of ramen that's a lot. That's what he thought. But didn't voice it out loud, then he asks. But, how do I know its value? They all came from the same material. That's your talent. It's what made them so special and valuable. Don't worry, I will introduce you my royal appraiser, he will handle all the evaluations fairly. Just remember not to give away any more of your painting for free, okay? Seeing him nod then frown he knew what's on his mind. Sure you can gift them to some close associates but please try not flooding the nation with them. It's an odd request as Naruto wonder what he meant. On one hand, he likes to paint but if he doesn't give them away he would eventually run out of spaces to store them. You mean I should stop painting? Hell, no, the fire daimyo was horrified he came to such conclusion thus corrects him. Paint as much as you want, but just don't give them away so freely. You worked hard on them, people should equally pay equivalently in exchange. I will introduce you to some trusted people and we will see where we go from there. We will start slow, so the elemental nation won't be too shocked when we finally introduce you to the world. As we stand now. People might think I am withholding treasures and keeping them for myself. Like Dojima says, the blonde needs to be constantly reminded that he's talented and his art is worthy of its value. Seeing that he's an orphan, the daimyo can understand where he come from. Combine it with the abuse he had received in the ninja village, it's no surprise by his behavior. I am talking about the mountains of art you left in prison. It felt wrong to move them hence why I am converting it into a museum. That statement in turn surprised the blonde because he never thought about it. Seeing his reaction the daimyo smiled, he may not have said it but deep down they were his precious memories. His paintings were all like that, like his expression they were easy to read if you know where to look. Hence, the least he could do is fulfill that unspoken wish. It's his way of thanking him for bringing that creation into the world. Anyway, what I wanted to say is that those paintings shall remain yours and under your name. So in a sense, I will be loaning them from you to put in my museum. This means I will handle its security and maintenance. Is that acceptable? The daimyo had to make it clearer so his young guest can understand. That means in the event they are lost or damaged, the fire court will be held responsible thus compensate you. It took some time but the daimyo is patient. It's basically you having ownership while I handle everything else. So if someone steals it or it's lost, it will fall under my responsibility to repay you for the lost item. This means you can still sell it or gift it away but I have a feeling they are rightfully where they belong. It's something he hadn't thought about but he didn't object to his ruling. As to Kanahagakur, that's a little tricky because it's on the prison wall. By law, the whole prison belongs to the country and we can't exactly separate it from the wall without damaging it. Looking at Naruto, the fire daimyo tries to think something with equal value to compensate. The trouble is, personally I think that's the greatest treasure of all, and sadly I can't think of any offer to compensate it. Even if I give you my palace, I doubt it will be enough. Yes, Naruto. It is that great of a masterpiece. Seeing the blonde's doubtless look, the Fire Lord couldn't help but laugh out loud. It's hard to put a price on something as extraordinary as it. Then again, it is his greatest work to date. The art is exceptional as it speaks for itself, it clearly illustrates what kind of place it is. However, its biggest selling point is how it can reflect on the feeling of longing for a home. Not only that, the wall painting makes everyone feel that impulse to love and defend it. Even that impulse is split on which, Kanahagakur, the actual village or just the wall painting. It truly illustrate what the place meant to the artist. The love for one's home. 
The wall painting speaks for itself as its details were uncanny because you can look forever and yet there's always something to be found. It made Dojima and the daimyo wonder if it's better to call it longing for home instead of Kanahagakur. Then again, which Kanahagakur do people truly love? The art or is it the actual village? In a sense the wall painting is like an illusion, something that's there yet not. Nevertheless, after seeing this people would be no doubt curious. Even a frequent visitor like the fire daimyo is amazed. Between the real thing and the painting, even he found himself at a loss in distinguishing the difference. It's so lifelike that make it so special. Just by seeing, it's like swimming through a memory lane. The term, swimming, is true because you will have to make an effort to truly, see. Hence, the term, in tune. It's something Dojima and the fire daimyo call it. As one has to be, in tune, to truly appreciate his work. Think of the fourth shinobi war in the manga where Naruto tells his regrets while Ino mind linked his feelings to everyone. I am second guessing here because I do not know if she's showing images like we see in the manga or it's just his feelings. Well, in this case only emotion will be felt through his paintings. So no images. Even without a clear understanding, his work is truly a masterpiece worthy of the term, priceless. Kanahagakur is magnificent as it illustrates the beauty of the village in its purest form. At the same time, people each draw a different conclusion from it but oddly enough they are all right. Take the fire daimyo as example, he had been to the village countless times. In his mind, he can see the ninja village enclosed by vast greenery as it reminds him of the Shodame. It's like the framed Hokage is still protecting the village with his wujutsu. The Shodame on the Hokage mountain is a strong indication of that and he isn't wrong. Whereas in Dojima's interpretation, he sees the vast greenery as another living entity. Thus seeing village a world within another which is also true. The fire daimyo wholehearted agreed because Kanoha wouldn't be Kanoha without the forest. Sometimes the two wonder if this is what the ninja village was or just the artist's interpretation. Then there's also the hidden secret within the painting. According to them, it's also the painting's biggest seller but in order to see it one have to be, in tune. At least that's what they call it. Only then can you see the surprise in the form of your own tears. An hidden emotion that's somehow insculped deep in the wall painting. Noon knows how it got there but it's there. It's both chaotic and erratic as multiple emotions bombard and bounce around. Love, hate, the sense of determination and devotion all mixed together. By the time the reader managed to adjust themselves that's when the tears starts to fall. In the end, some may still ask themselves how something so beautiful can be so sad. Only Dojima and the fire daimyo seems to think they have the answer. However, it's still only their speculation because they couldn't ask the author himself. As being said, it was through the painting that they think they found the answer. That means going through that emotional turmoil to get there. Hence, when it comes to talking to the blonde they found themselves unable to bring it up. However, they have a feeling that the two, Kanoha and Naruto, are very connected. Therefore regardless what Naruto thinks, he will one day have to confront the village. Hence until then, they can wait. Bonus Kurosaki, treasurer, coming back to Kurosaki, he may not understand what the secrecy was about but assuming his new friend, Ryoma, is in some way connected to his boss, he made it his mission to ask about it on their next meeting. As it turns out, Ryoma's action helped the daimyo because he's struggling on his own trying to think up a plan. Now that Ryoma steer his treasurer to him, he can drag poor Kurosaki into the mess. Of course, poor Kurosaki didn't know about the trap until he's at the prison and saw what's in store for him. So he ended up categorizing and evaluating everything, it took him over a month to go through them. It was unfortunate because it has to be detailed. Sadly it was easier said than done, as even experts in Suna are still working on their painting. It took Suna months and they still hadn't got very far with one painting, hence one can imagine the pain Kurosaki is feeling. 
The paintings aren't the problem but to accurately put a prize on it is. Then there's the Kanahagakur on the wall. When he first saw it, it literally blew his mind. He was only snapped back after hearing Dojima's chuckle as he explains that's normal reaction. As fire treasurer, he had seen countless treasures but this. He's speechless. Because there's simply nothing to describe what he's seeing. Weeks later, the fire daimyo arrived to talk about the plan. Sadly, there isn't one because no matter how they see it, war will always be on the horizon. What are you doing, Kurosaki? Eh, evaluating and documenting art? That's when the daimyo realized his mistake. Noo, don't tell me you've been doing that since you got here? Yeah, he didn't know how else to tell him otherwise. Sigh, never mind, you can do that in your own time. The main reason I had you here was to discuss how we make this public. Public? Kurosaki thought he heard it wrong. I am sorry, my lord. Are you aware of the Suna situation? Since the appearance of the Uziu painting, there had been over thirty attempts. Had it not been their state of art security in Ninja Village, their painting would have been long gone. Before he can go on, the Fire Lord raised his hands to calm him down. Kurosaki, I am well aware of the Suna situation as well as the Uziu painting. What I want is, how can we release them to the public without raise too many flags? Luckily the Fire Lord didn't mention Naruto the artist himself. Come to think of it, he surprised Kurosaki hadn't asked where they came from. Then again, the daimyo can understand how overwhelming it is. To someone like Kurosaki, to discover one such painting is a miracle but to find a building full of them it's something else. Although art isn't something everyone consider as treasure. However, Uziu is different because they are truly a marvel that trigger an evolution to the art world. Art is perhaps boring to a lot of people, but Uziu art completely changes that perception. They are a new dimension the art world had never been seen before and couldn't be replicated. There's a story in every one of them and each unique. It's one reason the Fire Lord wanted everyone to see them because it's what the elemental countries want and need. Seeing them firsthand, he felt the world can come to an understanding that can bring peace without fighting. It may sound far-fetched but Naruto's art does somewhat have that influence. Like how music can bring sadness and joy to people, Naruto's art too have similar effect but perhaps more powerful. His Kanahagakur is one fine example, as it can bring a sense of joy and sadness at the same time. Similarly, his other work Waterfall had similar effect but on a lesser extent. Waterfall not only holds the essence of peace and tranquility, it also show the majesticalness of the great waterfall from an angle. Some of his work also made many wonder how he captured from the impossible angle, unless you can fly. Unknown to them, Naruto got them from both simulation and imagination. His waterfall piece was a good example as he got that from actual pictures and watching water overflowing from prison sink. That immediately gave him inspiration to make his own simulation. Thanks to his creativity, he's able to imagine it from a majestic distance thus give birth to his creation, the waterfall. Again, Kirito did say he's a genius. In the meantime, both the daimyo and Kurosaki will have a hard time coming up with a plan. Either way, Kurosaki will disappear for a while from his friends. Funny enough when his friends gather, it's Ryoma that had an answer. As he speculate it's probably fire country business. They all knew who he is, so it's no surprise for his sudden disappearance. Then again, it's not something they can openly discuss. Again, only Ryoma seemed to have an idea why but he didn't let it shown on his face. Even when he gave away that information he only guided the others to that conclusion. Anyone know what happened to Kurosaki? He hadn't joined our meeting in weeks now. No idea, think we should check up on him? Isn't Kurosaki the daimyo's treasurer? Is it normal for him to disappear like that? You are right, Ryo Mason. Last time he even went to Suna for weeks. He's probably called off for another errand for the Fire Lord. 
it wouldn't be several months later that he's back with his friends. He may not have mentioned it but somehow he gets the feeling that Ryoma knew more than he let on. When he gave them excuse he was busy categorizing the Fire Lord's assets in a storage, only Ryoma seems to find it funny. It's very different to others' acceptance expression. It made sense, thus explains his long disappearance from his home. Only Ryoma seems to think otherwise thus lead him to believe he knew where he was. At least that's his own feeling but as for the fire Daimyo ordered him, the museum must be kept strictly a secret. It's just too bad that the fire Daimyo had forgotten about Doja Mason. As Naruto settled himself in the capital, Noon and Konoha were aware in his status. This include the ninja village's spy master Jiraiya. Unfortunately Jiraiya only learned of this one month before the final Chunin exam. By then he was forced to confine in the village because of his teammate's appearance. This was both agreed by his sensei and the elders of the village. In fact, the whole village was on high alert since the snake Sanin had warned them the consequences in cancelling the exam. However, nothing happened but Kanoha extended that unrest for a few more months. Thanks to Orochimaru's cunninginess, the village be too careful. Nevertheless, the top brass still couldn't understand why he would make such declaration while not acting on it. The village's strategist Shikaku thought the snake Sanin would have something planned. After all he did appear and marked Sasuke. So the village remained on lockdown for extra two months. As for Jiraiya, since he's the village's key defense against the rogue Sanin they forbid him from going anywhere. This includes searching for his godson. He's overruled by the elders as well as his own sensei. Jiraiya, I know you are frustrated but as you know the village must come first. The village, the village. Minato's son is out there in prison. Put there by the village he gave his life for. Jiraiya. You and I know we cannot change the past. Right now the village is in a crisis. Sternly, the Sandame reminds him of his duty and importance of the current event. What he's saying is Naruto's situation being six years ago therefore isn't as important as what the village is now facing. Unfortunately, the Toad Sanin understood his sensei very well. As the need of one could never outweigh the many. He may hate himself for it but the Hokage is right, it's already been six years whatever's been done is done. So as much as he didn't want to admit it the damn elders were also right, he had no choice but stay on standby. Despite his decision, since the exam the snake Sanin never appear on the village's radar. The village tightened its security even after the exam and one month since then, still no Sanin. It confuses the higher-ups because they had no idea what happened. Either Orochimaru is overly patient and cunning, or something actually caught his attention. Cunning, yes, but patient? That's debatable. Didn't he tell them not to cancel the exam? Or was it all just a ruse? Even poor Anko had to be called in for questioning and Inoichi mind walked her just to be sure. Unfortunately, they never got their answer. Only poor Jiraiya was punished to remain on standby whereas other ninjas went back to active duty. Even then, he was further detained for another four months because the council couldn't figure out the snake Sanin's plan. Note, Jiraiya was in the village near the first month period of the Chunin exam, he was on standby for another month because of village security. His duty then further delayed him because the village was being overly cautious thus another four months went by. Based on the Naruto timeline Naruto should be around 12 years old, soon going to be 13 during the Chunin exam. In the manga, Jiraiya took him on a three-year journey and on last day of the fourth shinobi war he will turn 16. Hence, as some of you can see, in this story the timeline is changing. Hence, it's easy to imagine the Toad Sanin's frustration over the months. Just when he thought he's finally free from his duty he was given another mission and that's to find his other teammate. The Sande may not have voiced it but the way he had handled Naruto and Orochimaru made him realize how old he is. He was overdue for retirement, thus before his student leave he want him to recall his other student Tsunade Senju. 
Jiraiya wanted to curse his sensei but seeing his tired and wary expression he had to swallow that anger. Damn him, damn the village. Even he's starting to see why his female teammate left. Hiruzen Sarutobi had to sigh as he watched his student storm off. He knew he's angry but as the saying goes, the many outweigh the few. As Hokage it's his duty to ensure the people in his village is safe. Unfortunately, for both his student and Naruto, he will have to repent in. Some other way. Sadly, he couldn't help but wonder if he will live to see that day. In his mind, he's seeing another flashback as he thought back the times he trained his students. The most talented of the three turn enemy whereas the deadlast became the strongest and most loyal. Just what did he do wrong? Even today, he still couldn't figure out what he should have done to change that. While the Hokage is reminiscing the old days, Jiraiya is already at the gates. Out of my way. Izumo and Kotetsu knew better than to stop him, as they aren't foolish enough to halt an angry San Nin. Was that Jiraiya? Sure is, you can recognize him with that wild white hair. I heard he was confined to the village because of that Orochimaru mess. No wonder he's pissed. Good thing there's no protocol for leaving the village, at least not one for a San Nin. It was the only thing the Eternal Gate Guardians can do with their boring job. As for the Toad San Nin, he quickly summoned Gamabunta and be on his way. Jiraiya? Wah! The Toad boss was cut off from his rant. Save it, Gamabunta. We have more pressing business. I will tell you on the way. Gamabunta knew something serious is going on so he will abide to his summoner's command. On their way, the Toad boss too is told about Naruto's situation. It will later pass on to Mount Mayaboku as the elder Toads wonder about the Child of Prophecy. Even Jiraiya will wonder about that once he calms down but unfortunately Noon will have an answer, not even the Toad who made that prediction. Nevertheless, Jiraiya must first find Tsunade. Sadly, her location is currently out of date because the last intel was her being in Tenzaka Gai. Hence, his only option is to go there and trace her steps. Which in turn would take more of his time. He's no longer angry with his sensei as he redirected to his teammate. It's human nature so Noon can blame the Toad San Nin for it as he thought dark thought of his female teammate. Damn her! she's wasting her life away whereas Naruto was locked away. Where the hell is she, Tenzaku Gai is famous for its casinos no doubt she's gambling again. Damn her, I am wasting my time on her while Naruto is god knows where. The more he thinks about it the more frustrated he is. Thankfully, Jiraiya knew how to focus on his objectives. Thus, despite his dark thoughts his senses remain sharp to not miss any detail. Hence, it was easy to trace all the places she's been to. The tricky part is to figure out where she would go. Unfortunately, in order to do that he will have to be patient and gather more information. It's not likely she will tell her debt collectors where she will go. Luckily he isn't a master spy for nothing as he slowly traces her steps. His other problem is her weird psychic senses. He didn't know what to call it. Although it doesn't help her in her gamble but it's oddly accurate when it comes to knowing when trouble is coming her way. Sadly that's when it becomes. Tricky because she could be very unpredictable. Hence, including the travels, Jiraiya had to waste over another four months just to find her. In the end he wasn't even appreciated for his effort only to be shut out. That's when he cracked and lash out. Months of frustration finally caught up to him as he unload all his anger on his teammate. Obviously, Tsunade was stunned because for as long she knew him, he never once lose control like this. Jiraiya always has a soft spot for her. What's this about, she's obviously asking about his own agenda and not about the Hokage matter. Catching his breath, Jiraiya had to sigh but didn't immediately answer. Tsunade too didn't say anything for a while, giving him time to reorganize his emotions. Come on, I am sure you can spare a few minutes to tell your old teammate what's going on. Obviously this isn't about me becoming Hokage. 
This time, the toad Sam Neen couldn't hold it thus start telling her about his godson. A godson he thought was safely left in the village only for him to find out a year ago being sent to fire prison. The slug Sam Neen knew whom he's talking about, she may had left the village but the Minato and Kushina's son was all her teammate talk about before the Kyubi incident. However, to hear that he was sent to prison shocked and disgusted her. Especially after hearing about the incident on how a young child can be incriminated. What was her sensei doing? What about the ninja clans? Shouldn't they be actively object to these decisions? The more she hears, the more she's disgusted by what her grandfather's village had became. Near the end, Jiraiya had to apologize for his outburst but Tsunade forgave him. She's more pissed at the village. However, the troubling aspect is she split between accepting her job just to set the village straight or outright forget about the cesspool of a village. Go. Jiraiya. Go to your godson, she said. Haim, he hesitated because his mission is to bring her back to Kanoha. I will handle the village. You go find Naruto, her intention is clear as she's telling him to do what he should be doing and she will return to the village on her own. From the way she had said it, the toad Sanni knew she meant what she say. So with a grateful nod, Jiraiya set off on his quest. Tsunade too after finishing her drink returned back to her room and she didn't lie as she informed her travel companion their next destination. Shizun, pack our things. We will be leaving for Kanoha tomorrow. The younger ninja although a little surprised but nevertheless welcomed the decision because she had not seen her home for a long time. On the other hand, Jiraiya is left with a dilemma what he should say to his godson when they finally meet. Despite the long trek, the toad Sanin felt very uneasy. He didn't even know how to approach him. As according to the Hokage, the boy was sent to prison since he was six. Even then what will he do once he saw him, it's not like he had a pardon. Letter. In his rush to leave, he had forgotten about that. However, he continued anyway because he wanted to at least see his godson. As to getting him out, he will figure something out on the way. Maybe he can get to know him if he can rescue him. Train him like he's supposed to. Is Naruto the so-called, child of destiny? Either way, he will have to find him first. Still, it took Jiraiya over a week to get there without Gamabunta because he wanted time to think up something to say to his godson. As much as he wishes to hurry, he really need that first impression. Especially when the kid practically didn't know him. It certainly didn't help when he introduced himself as ninja of the village that sent him to prison. Unfortunately, whichever scenario he see himself in, he find himself in a very unfavorable position. After all, how can one forgive being hated for years and later accuse of a crime you didn't commit? What is worst is that he was forgotten or abandoned as he was left there for over six years. As soldier that fought in wars, the Sanni knew the feeling. When Jiraiya first heard it, he had asked for details. So he knew what happened to his godson. As the Hokage had tirelessly investigated, the evidence was long gone. The accusation was also solid as multiple witnesses points his godson being involved. Unfortunately, finding these witnesses were impossible as one way or another they were either missing or died in line of duty. Jiraiya was pissed but the crime was too perfect and the so-called evidences presented two all points to his godson involved in some way. Everything was just too perfect like they were staged. The Sanin wanted to kill someone but the councilman had left the village. Rumor has it that he got rich thus moved into the capital. He can smell corruption but all he could do is curse the people. They may not be silent killers like them, shinobis, but their methods can be just as ruthless. Without him knowing, Jiraiya found himself already at his location. However, what surprised him is the oddity in the prison's appearance. The first thing that strike him odd is there is only one guard? Halt! Who are you, at least he's attentive. Nevertheless, he responded as politely as he can. I am Jiraiya the Sanin, I wish to speak to the warden. Warden? 
This time it was the guard's turn to be confused. Ah, I think I understand. For your information, this is no longer a prison. As a matter of fact, it's been closed for over two years. However, you are in luck as the former warden Doja Mason is still here. Perhaps he can help you. I will go get him. M, thanks. The Toad Sanin didn't know what to say as his mind had been racing and had been focusing on his godson. Closed? Closed for over two years? So where's Naruto now? Over six years they left him and now they don't even know where he is. He hoped the old warden have some useful information. Then there's the issue about the closed prison. Why was? It closed, he didn't think it mattered as it's the least of his concern. Things are getting complicated but at least the old warden is still around. Jiraiya hope he can tell him something and thankfully he didn't have to wait long. Hi, I am the Toad Sa. But he was cut off. I know who you are, Jiraiya. What do you want? The white-haired Sanin was a little surprised by the tone of his resentment. Why is he angry at me? However, Jiraiya is in urgent need of information so he ignore his attitude in hope he can find out more on his godson's whereabouts. Air, I am here about a Kanoha citizen that was here over six years ago. The ninja can sense his attitude change as Dojima's expression harden and glare right at him. Thankfully, he answered anyway. You are wasting your time here, the prison is closed and all prisoners were transferred to the shinobi prison. He didn't exactly lie as all prisoners were indeed transferred. However, what he left out is the majority of prisoners were pardoned by the daimyo thus were no longer considered as prisoners. What pisses him off is Kanoha showing up now. Dojima wasn't just angry as he's furious and had to suppress that rage before coming to see him. Even then, it wasn't enough to hold back that disdain he had on the Sanin. Shortly after the kids picking up his life, Kanoha choose now to show up. Hence, Dojima didn't care thus how he's less helpful with information. Then again, it was the fault of the Toad Sanin whom wasn't very specific and the ex-warden is less forthcoming to correct him. There's an awkward silence soon after as Jiraiya's lost in what he has to say. It's not often he gets such treatment, especially after knowing whom he is. Nevertheless, he had correctly deduced the man for some reason didn't like him. Unfortunately, for the life of him he could not figure out why. Did I spy on his wife or something? Or his daughter? Or something about my book? Nervously, he thought he should get going before things turn ugly. His godson is more important anyway. All right, thanks. I will be on my way. Impassively, Dojima watched him leave. He thought he could make it less personal but years in dealing with those extreme Kanoha prisoners made him a little biased. Seeing the Sanmin disappearing, he too starts to return back to his own station. However, on his mind he's thinking of something else. I guess it's starting. He and the fire daimyo had long predict Naruto is someone more connected to the village than anyone from the leaf. Hence, despite his message hidden in his painting the two firmly believe he and Kanoha will one day face one another. Therefore, the appearance of the Sanin did not surprise him. Instead he thought it was long overdue. However, he still thinks he should work harder to find the kid thus giving him a tougher time. As for the Sanin, it's like one obstacle to another. This time it's the guards. At least this time, the prison looked more like a prison. Because the security is intense. Unfortunately for him he was prohibited to enter or granting an audience. Look, it's important. I just need to speak to your supervisor. I don't care if you are the Hokage, you have no authority here. No paperwork, no deal. Even the easygoing Jiraiya is getting pissed by the guard's attitude but he had to at least make an effort for his godson. I just want one name, an AR. Sadly the guard wouldn't even hear him. Like I said, no signature, nothing, the lead guard said firmly. Shinobi sometimes acted as pigs and samurai guards were no different. 
If they have an opportunity to boss a ninja around some would literally jump the chance. Then again, this is a high security prison. Hence, there had been countless ninjas trying to both break in and break out for one reason or another. Therefore, extra and sometimes extreme countermeasures are employed. Like any other ninja, Jiraiya wouldn't give up. Especially when he's Kanoha's spy master. So if he couldn't get in on the front entrance, he will have to go in through the back. It wasn't literal, it just means he will have to infiltrate it some other way. Unfortunately, the shinobi prison isn't just big it's also built like a fortress. It's built to not only keep prisoners in, it's built to repel specially ninjas. Not to forget, seals at every doorway to dispel Genjutsu and Henge. Even he was almost discovered when the guards thought they saw his summon. Lucky for him, they thought it was a rat so they couldn't link the incident to him. News of him trying to break into their lord's prison certainly wouldn't look good on Kanoha's end. As being said, the whole prison was alerted because of one animal. Then again, he couldn't fault them as ninjas have far too many means to count. Nevertheless, his situation didn't improve as he had to beat in hasty retreat. He got out before the lockdown took place. So all he could do is gather information from nearby towns. Even if he couldn't do anything, he wants to confirm what the ex-warden said was true. Despite their meeting being less than pleasant, Jiraiya didn't think he had a reason to lie. At least with the prison on lockdown, that's all he could do anyway. He left a toad to keep watch over the prison to inform him when security is not so tight. As it turns out, there's indeed a massive transfer of prisoners over a couple of years ago. However, what he didn't find out is its capacity. Then again, those prisoners were inside massive steel cages, accompanied by the fire daimyo's personal guards, they took care of the transfers. Hence, to normal civilians it gave them a false illusion that something big is going on. Like rumors go, the event was exaggerated. Unfortunately, through Jiraiya's ears he's thinking such security measure could be because of Naruto's Jinchuriki status. Since the Fire Lord wasn't present at the time, thus they must be transporting high-priority targets. Unknown to the San Nin, the Fire Lord's personal guards and army were split in two to both defend the Fire Country ruler and handled the transportation. It's a momentary decision, hence why it was the Royal Army doing the transportation. Then he realized something else. Did Naruto even receive the same treatment as his fellow prisoners? His biggest concern is, what did they do to him? Did he even get a cell to see daylight? Under normal circumstance, because of Jinchuriki's status they could lock him in a heavily sealed room like in a dungeon. The San Nin again cursed the villagers what they had done to Minato's son. Most of all, he cursed himself for leaving him in the village. Considering the possibilities, he sees no alternatives but to see the Fire Lord. He dreaded the meeting because the Fire Lord will most likely ask him questions he wouldn't want to answer. In the worst case scenario, penalties and loss of funding may happen. Unfortunately, with Akatsuki on the rise, his godson became an important figure of interest. Fire Capital When Jiraiya finally reached the capital. As expected, the Fire Lord asked him to explain to him the whole ordeal. Knowing he couldn't lie his way, he explained what he knew thus leaving nothing out. Oddly enough, Jiraiya had expected the man to be furious but he took it rather well. Just as I had suspected, your civilians had planned the whole thing. That's where Jiraiya noticed something. Just as you had suspected, the Sanin unconsciously repeat what the daimyo had said then quickly asks. What do you mean by that, my lord? I am quite surprised Dojaim hadn't told you, but I wouldn't blame him. As he was one of many that watched over him over the years. Then it clicked, since he was the warden it's obvious he knew Naruto. After a while, Jiraiya had to ask. Is Naruto still with him? Narutokun is here, and in the capital. His affectionate use of Kun was not missed by the San Nin but he let the daimyo finish. Seeing his people had practically abandoned him. Jiraiya wanted to correct him but couldn't rebut that accusation. Technically, 
Kanoha did forsaken him. The civilians were obvious, unfortunately the clan also did not care to vote against that decision. Sadly the final nail was the Hokage as he controls the final verdict. So, the fire daimyo was right, the village did abandon him. Continuing from the daimyo. So, I offered him a place here in the capital. Jiraiya truly did wanted to rephrase the fire lord statement because he thought it's harsh. However, he's running from the truth. It was one of the main reason that the royalty wanted him to acknowledge that. He didn't want the village to make excuses, what is done is done and it's already been over seven years. Jiraiya, I want it to be very clear. Whether Naruto want to go with you or not, it's up to him. If you can't convince him, leave him be. But, the vill, he will need the village's protection. He wanted to say the village need him but. After seeing the Fire Lord's harsh look on him he knew he had to change that statement. Hence, the excuse that the ninja village will be protecting him. No excuses, let the boy decide his own fate. He clearly saw through the Sanin's deception thus his warning. The village had already abandoned him once, claiming they will protect him are only empty words. Having said his final piece the Fire Lord turned away. As for Jiraiya, he still couldn't understand why his godson wouldn't return. Didn't Sensei say he loved the village? What about becoming Hokage? I could personally train him, teach him his father's signature moves. Having thought about everything his sensei told him, he's already at the main gate. It wasn't difficult to find his place. Like the Fire Lord says, it's just outside the main gate. He couldn't help but whistle. Perhaps, he's better off here. It may not be a mansion but it's way better than his crappy apartment in Kanoha. I guess it may be a little more harder to convince him. Nevertheless, he stepped forward for the inevitable encounter. I wonder if he's in. Unfortunately, little did he know, things are more complicated than he thought. Lucky for him, Naruto came to the door. After a brief meeting, one thing lead to another. Just why should I come with you? I have nothing to do with Kanoha anymore. It's for your safety, there are some dangerous people looking for you. You mean the snake freak? The Sanin immediately recognized that reference associating to his old teammate. What? You met Orochimaru? That's old news, it happened nearly a year ago and never saw him since. Eh? That doesn't sound like him. Tell me what happened. Hashtag 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 flashback Orochimaru hashtag 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 what Naruto said was true. Since the Suna episode and Sound 4's failure in stealing the Desert Lotus, Orochimaru was there personally to see this hyped painting. He was also curious about its rumors in changing the fate of the village. Most of all, he also wants to confirm his subordinate's tale on the ridiculous security. They were not wrong as its securities are top-notched. He had been there for over a week and personally witnessed its transition. What a marvelous concept. The snake Sanin couldn't help but consider such innovation used in his lair. Unfortunately, the cost would be astronomical. It wouldn't be practical anyway as his lairs were meant to be a temporary hideouts in case he's found by his many enemies. One thing he learned are that his ninjas didn't lie. Based on his own analysis, even he would have problem bypassing the multi-layer and multi-system defenses. However, despite the security marvel in the museum it was the Desert Lotus that had he most intrigued. While the Sanmin agreed that it's one unique piece of art, Orochimaru couldn't help but find something's missing from it. Even a genius such as he couldn't understand why and he had spent over a week trying to figure it out. Like many experts, he can sense there's no ninjutsu involved. Like an itch he couldn't scratch, Orochimaru too had his ninja search for the non-existent artist. Too bad, his ninjas had the same amount of luck as any other ninja as the only evidence of the artist's existence is the desert lotus. That was until Mizuki comes into play and by chance Kabuto discovers his true identity. 
This happened right after the Forbidden Scroll incident. Like it is fated to happen, Mizuki steals the scroll only to be caught. Long story short, after they managed to get every information off him, they shipped him off to the Shinobi prison. That's where he met the civilian prisoners. As fellow QB hater, the group got along well and the ex Chunin learn about the blonde's predicament. He vowed to find the demon and finish the job. Normally, Orochimaru or Kabuto would have left him to rot but with Suna out of the picture they needed another strategy, thus the prison. That's how the snake's right-hand man learned about the blonde Jinchuriki. It may seem like a long shot but Kabuto was confident that Naruto Uzumaki is the true face behind this mystery artist. The reason Noon knew whom he is or find him is because he's locked up in prison. It was also for same reason why there's so few of his art on the elemental nation. As the civilian prisoners vowed with their own lives, Kabuto had no doubt his work are still in the old prison. Once Kabuto report his surprising find, Orochimaru too came to the same conclusion. Thus, ignoring his plan to the leaf village he left to see this old prison for himself. Since the desert lotus, his mind had been itching. At the same time, he also wanted to find what he was missing. He had already marked the Uchiha, hence his main objective is more or less completed. The destruction of the village would have been a nice bonus but he isn't arrogant enough to think he can fight the top hidden village by himself. Without support from Suna, it's one huge setback to his original plan. Since he couldn't get the Kazakage alone or him to agree, he had to scrap the invasion. Although he has another trump card in form of the past Okages but he wouldn't get the satisfaction in seeing his sensei's look when he summons them. His feud with his sensei was personal, hence the destruction of the village is only a bonus. As a genius, Orochimaru also took pride in his plans thus he wouldn't fight a pointless battle where he will be put on a disadvantage. That's where strategy comes in. Unfortunately, he had to admit even a prodigy like himself he could never beat Inara. Combined with the loss of element of surprise because they knew he's coming in home field advantage. His status may cause even Shikaku Nara to be very wary but Orochimaru wouldn't bother fighting a fight where he has to do all the work. On the other hand, he's also side-tracked by another matter. It was an issue that perked his curiosity since his visit to Suna. As according to Kabuto's. Source, the original author of The Desert Lotus is in the Old Fire Prison. By latest intel, the prison while no longer operational there's a monument left there by the creator that could not be moved. Although those fools wouldn't say what it was but claimed it's on the wall, so it wouldn't be so easy to move. Interested in this new development Orochimaru had Kabuto gather more intel whereas he himself go to investigate this monument. Very few things interests him and the genius San Nin wanted to know why even he's entranced by something like a painting. It's very mystery and it hurts his pride to not understand it. For someone like Orochimaru, it would be a joke to not able to sneak in. Unlike the museum in Suna, the security there were almost non-existent. He just slither in like a snake without a sound or being seen. The place was nearly empty but he surprised to find a gallery in place. At least the intel's legit and his trip is not wasted. He hoped Kabuto can get more information on the artist and his whereabouts. As he made his way through the gallery, the first thing he noticed are the style. They are all his work. Fascinating. How very interesting. Only the creator of the The Desert Lotus can produce something that can affect someone like him. It was for this reason that his respect for the author went up a few notches. To have one that can capture his interest is already a miracle but a gallery of them, that's something else. Unfortunately, despite right in front of him Orochimaru still couldn't understand how they are triggering such foreign feeling within him. The Sanin took his time and the guards were non-consequential as they couldn't even detect him. So slowly he move along and eventually making his way to Kanahagakura. The final piece both stunned and mystified him, he too almost thought he's there in Kanahagakur. Still he has enough common sense to not attack or hate it, it's just a painting. Oddly enough, he couldn't hate it. Is it because he know it's a painting? 
even he doesn't know why. With this author's work, one can never truly distinguish reality from illusion. Unfortunately, that's also when Doja Mason happens to see him. At least he thought he saw him. However, just before he can be sure the figure vanished. Like a dutiful director he is, he start questioning everyone, counting and recounting all the paintings while making sure nothing is amiss. Meanwhile, Orochimaru was long gone. Like how he arrived, he left without a trace. On his way, he's finding himself even more curious. Hopefully, Kabuto have something. Despite that, he still couldn't help but contemplating over the strange events. Why am I even fuzzing over art? They are more of Sasori or Daidara thing. He can see himself relating to forbidden jutsus and eternal life etc. But, art? Another thing that concerns him is despite all the amazing pieces, he found himself unable to connect with any of them. Again it's something even. He himself couldn't understand. That's the reason why he's interested in the author because perhaps he has an answer. Thankfully, Kabuto came back with more useful intel. He didn't even have to sneak in. Through his connection, he had other prisoners to do his work for him. What was that painting crap said last time? What? Not you too? I told you it's that foo asterisk 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 demon. Damn hell spawn even bewitched the fire lord and got us sent here. You know if you lied to us, all of us will come back for your head. Of course a threat here and there encourage them to give them better. Believe me, the old prison still has the drawing the demon spawn made. I doubt it can be moved, anyone can check it out if you don't believe me. Unlike the old, this prison contain more deadly elements so the Kanoha civilians wouldn't dare bantering for anything. Like the saying goes, it's better with the devil than in its path. Hence, through those conversations Kabuto drew his own conclusion. It's pretty clear since he's also from Kanoha. It all made sense, it's gotta be the Kyubi Jinchuriki. It wasn't hard to deduce whom they were talking about because only those from Kanoha would describe the Kyubi Jinchuriki that way. Kabuto's surprise he's found out this much as the artist they had been search was right under their nose the whole time. It's no wonder Noon could find him, he's been locked in prison the entire time. However, the problem is, where is he now? Hmm, if what they say is true. Then the Fire Lord is also somehow involved. Since there's no news for his return to Kanoha, he's likely in the capital. At least based on those conversations, the Fire Lord seemed to have a soft spot for him. Fools are easy to read and manipulate, thus Kabuto is sure he can find answer in the capital. Otherwise it will be another trip to the Shinobi prison. Again, past conversation also conclude that the Jinchuriki could have gone with other prisoners. Another name that came up is Ryoma, whom they mentioned came from a mobster background. In the meantime, he and Sound 4 will head to the capital. This time, Sound 4 didn't fail as they brought the artist before their master. Hey, what's the big idea? A child was tossed to the cold hard floor and the bag over his head is immediately removed. As the blonde's eyes meets the Sanans, he knew he's the villain. He's obviously a villain, not only does he look like a snake he even exude an evil presence. Since he's here, there's no doubt in his mind he's also the culprit to his kidnapping. Then the villain starts to talk. Boy, I hear you are a painter. Make something to impress me. It's clearly not a request as it follows with a threat. Let me be clear, if your work isn't to my satisfaction I will feed you to my snake. Orochimaru made sure he understands by summoning the giant snake that will most likely eat him. The message is clear. The huge snake is definitely large enough to swallow. Him whole. Seeing he understands, the Sanin continued. If you are as good as they say. You will have my word, not only will you be freed I will even pay you for your troubles. My people will even return you immediately without harm. He emphasized the terms immediately and without harm, but that's only on the condition that he succeeds. 
As he finished, the snake San Nin is quite amused to see him respond with a glare. Very few dared to defiant him, hence he too responded with a raised eyebrow. Especially one that's not even a ninja. Anyone would be quite nervous considering his summon is now hissing loudly beside him. One command was all he need and his snake would pounce. The kid has guts. Nevertheless, it's still very amusing. On the other hand, Naruto don't like threats. He knew he's a target but he's being stubborn. While he may not know who he is, the threat is clearly very real. However, that wasn't what irked him. What he couldn't forgive is he looking down on him. Yes, the evil snake ninja can easily kill him but he can't make him do anything. Despite that, what's on his mind is more devious. He will paint all right, he will just paint something beyond the freak's comprehension. This is another odd scene he's seeing as Orochimaru look at his prey. He may not be able to read his mind, but the kid's emotional change was not lost in his eyes. He recognized that look, it reminds him of his home village. That stupid phase his sensei always says the will of fire. It's ironic that it came from someone they cast out. The moment they knew whom the artist is, Orochimaru had Kabuto dug up information on him. Thus, he knew about the boy's status. A supposed ninja village weapon reduced to civilian that turned into an artist. Despite his Jinchuriki status, without training he's still a zero threat. So Orochimaru's amused. Just how will he fight him? However, on the outside he continues to show his lack of interest appearance. As being said, he's curious. Other than forbidden jutsus, eternal life, he surprised something like art catch his interest. Or is it just his art that concerns him? Another reason he had him brought here is he's hoping to uncover that secret. On the other hand, the kid is also interesting. He's without a doubt talented, as his painting speaks for itself. It's because of this, his heart is for some reason filled with anticipation. When the painting first surfaced, he didn't think much on them but they did catch his interest. It wasn't the painting itself but its effects had him very intrigued. The snake Sanin thought he had reached the summit in understanding everything, but was surprised to find something he wasn't even aware of. To make matter more interesting, it's not ninjutsu, senjutsu or any of the areas he's familiar with. Finally, another reason he had the brought here is to see if there's any fuenjutsu involved. Since he couldn't sense anything abnormal through his paintings, his only conclusion would be fuenjutsu. At least that would explain how he's drawn to them. Hence why he had everything prepared beforehand. You will find everything you need over there, I suggest you get started. Having finished what he has to say, he silently returned the stare. For a few minutes, the two were locked in a silent standoff. Not knowing what to do, the Sound 4 took their guests in action as some form of refusal thus were about to take action. Leave him be. To their surprise, it was their master that stopped them. Then they thought, the kid's the only civilian in the room, thus it's clear he's not going anywhere. Hence, his only option is to either start working unless he wants to stay for a very long while. Their master's right, the kid's not going anywhere. On the other hand, Orochimaru saw more than that. The kid never did outright refuse his demand, so he's wondering what he's thinking about. Despite the look, the snake Sanin didn't think he's just glaring at him. Instead he felt like he's being scrutinized thus he unconsciously made himself sitting straightener and making himself more regal looking. It's like getting your photo taken, you would try to make yourself look better. As odd as it may seem, the snake Sanin is quite sharp in picking up those little details. Hence, why he told his guards to let him do as he wish. As a result, Sound 4 found themselves feeling like they had been left out on something. It's made them feeling like they were the third wheel. Since Orochimaru hadn't dismissed they had no choice but to stand on standby. The kid may not know how ruthless Orochimaru is but they do. True to the snake Sanin's expectation, 
after a while the blonde artist wordlessly made his way to his workstation. It didn't take him long to start working. While the others are curious, none dared to step forth to further incur the Sanin's wrath. His orders were absolute and since he's sitting there patiently, they too must stand idly unless he says so. As he watch him work, the others too were curious but none of them dared to step forth to incur the snake Sanin's wrath. Orochimaru's no different as he too is extremely intrigued but didn't let it spoil his surprise. Internally, Orochimaru too is very intrigued but he didn't let it spoil his surprise. To those used to the Sanin's antics, they would find him very odd and out of character. However, they wisely kept their own thoughts to themselves. As they thought about it, their master's correct. As a civilian, he isn't likely going anywhere in a room full of ninjas. So he can either start work or stay for the rest of his life. From the looks of it, Orochimaru too is content to wait as long as he want. Under normal circumstances, patience isn't his strong suit but a civilian trapped in his lair amuse him. Others too can see this thus wouldn't dare interrupting his entertainment. Despite that, the young civilian erratic behavior is not lost on sound four. Just what the hell is he doing? From the corner of their eyes, they can see him splashing a whole bucket of paint onto the canvas. At first they thought he's throwing a tantrum. Seeing Orochimaru not looking what he did, they too wouldn't dare draw attention to themselves. Curiously, Sound 4 continues to take sneak peeks. At least he's now more normal. Well, as normal as he can be climbing the ladder up and down trying to work on the oversized canvas. The four couldn't help but turn their sight back on their master. The snake Sanin is oddly silent and hadn't even moved an inch. Is he painting the boss? It was what's on their minds, but at the same time wouldn't dare to disturb him or make a sound. Perhaps that's the reason why he's sitting more regal and dignified than he usually is. Orochimaru isn't one for patience and his subjects knew that. Hence, unlike their guest they can see how different he is. He is obviously still very creepy, but oddly less creepy. They all thought about it but clearly wouldn't openly bring it up. Eventually, it was done. Well? Is it finished? Naruto said nothing, he returned that same stare while wiping his hands. He want the Sanin to draw his own conclusion. The kid sure has guts. He still had that defiant look. Ignoring him, Orochimaru turns to the painting, only to see a pitch-black portrait. What the? However, before he could turn that anger on the creator, he caught something. A silhouette or something but it only somehow appear on the corner of his eyes. What attracted him is the creepy feeling that's on par of his own. Is this some kind of payback from the kid? Payback or not, Orochimaru had to see it closer. The feeling is like knowing there's a buried treasure to be discovered. Hence, his sense is filled with both excitement and anticipation. He couldn't see it fully but he knew the kid did what he asked. It still amazes him how something you can see but at the same time not. As a scientist, it should be physically impossible. Yet, he's seeing it with his own eyes. It took a while and the trick is to not look at it directly. Perhaps it's the brat's little childish little revenge but the end result came out better than what he expects. Nevertheless, the brat did fulfill their agreement. He may not be able to see now but through little glimpses he can see a beautiful and majestic creature waiting for him to discover. To some people, the pitch black veil is perhaps an annoyance but to him it was perfect. It adds a sense of mystery to an already enigma painting. Paid the kid and take him home. Sound 4 was stunned as they thought they heard him wrong. Having seen the pitch black painting, the four could not understand what's going on. Then again, how much are they paying him? Thankfully before they can misinterpret him, he added. Use the scroll in my vault. It's another bombshell as the four stood rooted in their spot. But, Oro Kimurusama. It's making. No sense because they knew what it meant as the scroll contains the village's entire treasury. 
Having served him for years, they can't believe he would agree to pay let alone such crazy amount. Just do it, his work is at least worth that much. Had the kid just hypnotized him? Orochimaru ignored them as he continues to admire the newly created painting. Despite their uncertainty, Sound 4 slowly made their way to the vault. They hesitated because none of them were certain this is exactly what their master wanted. On their way, they stressfully inform him they are leaving and along with the kid's money. He's clearly still mesmerized with the painting as he waves them off. It didn't take them long to sneak him into his home. Here kid, I don't know what you did. I hope you didn't do anything stupid because if our master wakes up from whatever crap he's in he will want retribution. Having said that, they dropped the scroll and left. Picking up the scroll, not knowing how to open it he left it where it was before going to sleep. Crazy clients. That's all he said before start sleeping. He plans to visit the palace again anyway so the accountant can handle it. The crazy snake did say it's his payment. Little did he or the accountant know that there is 26 million Rio stuffed in the scroll. Of course, Naruto probably wouldn't be telling him about the kidnapping. Hi Naruto, what can do for you today? Hi Yashihasen, I just got this yesterday. The ninja said it was my payment, you think you can handle it? Alright, it's no problem. The usual, right? Sure. While a storage scroll is new coming from Naruto because he usually deal with royalties. However, it's fairly common transaction among the royal court. Even the 26 million came no much a surprise because the blondes work often fetch into 10 million range. As his accountant, Yashiha certainly had seen his paintings so he can understand the hype. Back to present with Jiraiya, what? That's it, cries the toad Sanin. Yeah. That's it. What more do you want? Didn't you even report it? No. I don't see the point. By then, Jiraiya didn't what to say. Orochimaru, the most wanted missing Nin in Fire Country came and kidnapped him and he didn't even bat an eye. Then again, Naruto is a civilian, why would he care whom the snake San Nin is? Even giving him a list of missing Nins or the bingo book, he wouldn't know what to do with them. As a defenseless civilian it's not like he can avoid them. Hence, once Jiraiya realized that he had no comeback. There's also his ex-teammate's overly odd behavior. It's unprecedented and the toad San Nin cannot understand why Orochimaru would spend all that effect to take his godson only to dump him back. What the foo asterisk asterisk is happening? Unfortunately for him, in Naruto's eyes he's the crazy one. Nevertheless, Jiraiya is still left with a ton of unanswered questions. Sadly, they are something only his ex-teammate can answer and he doubt he will be seeing him anytime soon. Wait a minute, he paid, only to see the blonde nod. Not just that, he paid 26 million Rio. Jiraiya can see him ransacking village, experimenting on villagers, but to actually pay? Again, he had to stress the amount slowly 26 million Rio? Wait a minute, are you telling me you are the reason Orochimaru was acting this strange? Again, that accusation wouldn't make any sense to the blonde. It's not like he knew how the snake San Nin used to act. Hence, his accusation only made him look more silly to the Jinchuriki. Flashback Orochimaru and Manda 26 million Rio while is no small sum, Orochimaru is nevertheless pleased with what he had paid for. In fact he's so pleased with the painting he had it framed behind his throne. It's used to be his lair but now it's his throne. Why? It's because that's where he received visitors and the guests often found themselves intimidated, and Orochimaru liked that feeling. He can easily see it in his guests. They tries to hide it but all of them couldn't help but feel a presence behind that mystery pitch black painting. Unfortunately for these people, Orochimaru's presence only amplify that sense of uneasiness. Like a snake he is, Orochimaru enjoyed watching them squirm. To the him the portrait gave him a sense of power, a feeling of control. Unfortunately, to those in audience with him, 
the feeling is like having a monster behind him yet at the same time unable to see it. It's exactly what Orochimaru wanted. Hence, what was once considered as his lair which he could abandon at any time, it's now his throne. As oddly as it may seem, it change him for the better. Instead of ordering his people, he now listens to them. Even if it's just to see their scared look, Orochimaru nevertheless fulfills his duty as the village's leader. Naruto's original plan was to make something that would make his captor eat his words. Little did he know, he may had succeeded in making Orochimaru wasting over two months to truly see it but it met his taste. Our hero thought he could scare him but instead it was what the Sanin had wanted. The creepiness of the portrait fit his image to a T. Despite not understanding what's behind the pitch black painting, the snake Sanin sensed a familiarity thus finally found his connection. Once he figured out what he think it was, he only loved it more. Although he can always ask the kid, but the mysteriousness made it more meaningful. However, what Orochimaru couldn't anticipate was for his summon to find out. One day Manda appear and demanded to know what this painting is. Orochimaru, what is this painting I hear so much about? Apparently, some of his summons was curious about the new painting thus raised a few heads in the summon world. Eventually, the news was leaked to the boss summon. Manda knew his summoner thus it's wondering why a painting is catching his interest. It didn't take him long to find it as it too narrowed its snake. Eyes. Mmmshirich, what is this? Obviously, it's also catching its interest. Unlike its summoner, it only took it 15 minutes to see it. Orochimaru, I want this. Unfortunately, his summoners immediately refused him. No! Exclamation point Equally surprised by his firmness, the snake renegotiated. I will offer my service for half of the original agreed sacrifice in exchange for the painting. The answer is still no, Manda. The painting stays where it is. After some more back and forth negotiation, the two finally came to an agreement. As Orochimaru says, the painting will stay but Manda can summon himself whenever he wants to see the painting. In exchange for zero sacrifices for his service, Orochimaru also agrees to remodel the throne room to accommodate his massive size. It turns out for the better as aside from the creepy portrait, both the Sanin and his huge summons presence only unnerve his guest more. Thankfully, Manda too saw the funny side in this whole arrangement. It's like watching the moment rats discovering they were in the same room as the apex predator. Their expressions were amusing but its entertainment is mostly on the pitch black portrait. Despite what it looked like, Manda was surprised to find something behind that pitch black veil. Like his summoner, he can only glimpse at what it think is there. However, what it saw interest him. As the king of the snake summon, Manda was surprised to find himself a little intimated. This in turn made it admiring the creature behind that painting. The two, Orochimaru and Manda, may not be able to see the creature clearly but that's the beauty of it. It's clear to them it's what's making the creepiness stand out. That's when the two's overall appearance starts to changing without themselves knowing. This was clearly not missed when Orochimaru meet with his fellow Sanans. Greetings, Jiraiya and Tsunade. The two immediately knew whom that voice belongs to. However, they had yet to see him until all that smoke is cleared. Timeline recap, the numbers are Naruto's rough age and month of that year along with the events, Naruto 11, 1 months, leaves prison, Naruto 12, 8 months, Chunin exam start, Naruto 12, 9 months, Chunin exam final, Naruto 13, 1 months, Naruto in Orochimaru's lair, Naruto 13, 2 months, Jiraiya leave for Tsunade, Naruto 13, 6 months, Orochimaru meeting with his fellow Sanans, Naruto 13, 6 months, Jiraiya start searching for Naruto, Naruto 14, 1 months, Jiraiya finding Naruto not decided. These are roughly the timeline estimated for now, in this story. Just a light warning, they may still vary depending on how the story progresses. The main emphasize is, by the time Jiraiya finds him several key events would have passed. 
they will obviously come in form of future chapters. Since I haven't written them yet, they aren't fixed. On another note, I may be complicating things but I want to at least write a story with some sense of logic before releasing them. Hence, when writing some of you will find that I am jumping from timeline to timeline. In a sense, what you see here is just a rough guideline. I would prefer Jiraiya to find Naruto when he's age 15 but that may seem unlikely. One main reason is, it's a little too unrealistic. So we will see. Back to the story the smoke took a little while to settle as the two Sanans waited for their ex teammate to show himself. It was odd because it took a little while longer, just a little to the edge of their patience. Indeed it's the snake Sanin but before he came out they notice his eyes first. It unnerved them but they didn't release their guard. That's when he strolls calmingly into view. He didn't just walked, from the way he moved it looked like he guided into place. All in one smooth motion. Their ex teammate is weird but this is beyond his usual standard. Orochimaru smirked, the two would have snapped but the dangerous vibe is making them overly cautious. This was obviously not lost in the snake Sanin's eyes. Then there's the stare, the two could not explain it but the feeling is like he's looking down on them. In terms of strength, Tsunade can easily pulverize him. Jiraiya too has his sage mode, therefore he too isn't short on power. Yet despite its two against one, they couldn't help but get the feeling they were the ones being cornered. Something's wrong? Again, none of them could explain it. Little did they know, this was all part of their teammate's strategy. His entrance may seem strange but they were all preparations to turn the field into his advantage. They were very subtle but at the same time very effective. What Orochimaru did was setting up his stage and as the result suggests, he was very successful. Enough of your games, team. Why are you here? I could ask the same of you. Despite it still two on one, it certainly doesn't feel that way and Jiraiya's attitude shows as he sounded like a rat about to be cornered. He's already prepared to unleash his attack if Orochimaru don't start answering his question. Actually, I was hoping to recruit Haim to my village but I see you beat me to it. No way in hell, I will let you Kuchiyos and Ojutsu. Tsunade had already agreed to return to Konoha, thus she too joined the fight as she too summoned Katsuyu. However, the last to summon had triggered another smoke screen. You can almost hear the two groan not again. They both knew whom it is and so do Gamabunta and Katsuyu. However, like the two Sanans when they first encounter this phenomenon they couldn't help but drawn their eyes to the huge shadow behind all that smoke. Its sharp eyes were the first to become visible as it sent shivers down everyone's backs before revealing its glorious self. Gamabunta couldn't help but whistle at its entrance. Nevertheless the damage is already done as the toad boss had unconsciously drawn his blade. Even Katsuyu is tense and she's a slug. All the summon, Manda stood tallest. As it looked down on them. Is it me or is Manda looking down on us? He isn't talking in literal sense because they all had a strange sense that's exactly what's happening now. Only Jiraiya and Tsunade marvel what happened to get their teammate like this. What's the team been smoking to get him like this, secretly wondered Jiraiya. He looked damn sane, that is the problem. Tsunade too added her own two cents from a medical point of view. Then she barked. Everyone looked sharp. Manda looked very dangerous. Despite it's a four against two, including summons, the four are the ones feeling oppressed. Looks like I won't be getting anything useful out of this. So I will retreat for now. The other two Sanans didn't object as they watch him leave. In fact, deep down they couldn't help but breath a sigh of relief. Sometime after Orochimaru left, Tsunade turns to her teammate. Go. Jiraiya. Go to your godson. Haim. I will handle the village. You go find Naruto. End of flashback, wait a minute, Orochimaru's strange behavior was because of you? 
Again, his godson only stared back at him with the look. How the heck would I know? Jariah again sweat dropped. Right? You probably wouldn't know what he was like before. All right, will you stop with that stare? Naruto said nothing but his eyes said it all. For some odd reason, Jiraiya see what he's thinking thus gaining another large sweat drop. He did say he's a San Nin, perhaps they are all weird like that. Jiraiya almost want to yell, he's not weird but a super pervert. Sadly that would make matters worse for him. These Kanoha ninjas are crazy. Again, the kid is very easy to read. Damn the kid is really expressive. The toad Sanmin thought but outwardly his express didn't change. First impression is everything, Orochimaru made his and now Jiraiya. No way in hell I am going with them. Sighing to himself, the Sanmin knew then convincing him will only be harder from now on. The fire daimyo said to let him make his choice. It's also clear why the daimyo say it will be difficult. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to share this video with your friends. Guys, make sure to help the author by visiting the link in the description. This is Fox Sage, and I'm signing off.